In this video, I'm going to open up my obsessive drawing patch and walk you through how it works. As you'd expect, the obsessive drawing patch opens up in presentation mode, where I can artfully arrange and size the user interface without affecting the performance of the Max patch itself. So to see the actual patch, we'll need to click on the presentation button in the toolbar to go into patching mode. At this level, the patch isn't really too complicated. Most of what you see here consists of user interface objects in our patch, each of which uses send objects to route data to the subpatches that do all the calculations. Since this is a Mac 6 patch, you won't see any load bang objects used to set the initial state of the user interface objects. Instead, I've turned on each of the user interface objects parameter mode enable attributes. Check the initial state box in the inspector and entered the initial values for my user interface. Nearly all of the work the obsessive drawing patch does happens inside the drawing subpatch. It connects the matrix control object I used to draw into the 8x8 matrix to the JIT P window object that displays the final results. Just in case you hadn't noticed, I am using a matrix control object for the drawing. It looks a little different than the grid of lines and buttons you'd normally see with a matrix control object because I've loaded a custom graphics file called Pixel Picked that gives me white and black squares. It's distributed along with the patch. Let's open the drawing subpatch and look inside. First, you'll notice a large number of receive objects that take data from the user interface and use it to format messages routed to various subpatches. In addition, you'll see three subpatches. The Display Controls subpatch takes information generated by clicking on the matrix control object and sends a list of the state of each of the 8x8 squares whenever they change. The Matrix Fill subpatch takes that list of data and uses it to create the basic matrix we'll use for image processing. And the Matrix Iterate subpatch handles the selection logic, the overlaying of images, and takes care of things such as image offsets, image anchors, and image inversion. Let's take a look inside each of these subpatches. The Display Control subpatch has a simple task. Every time you click on a square in the 8x8 matrix control object, it instructs the matrix control object to output a row-by-row -row list of the state of the entire matrix. Clicking on any square in the 8x8 matrix triggers that action. Inside the patch, a speed limit object helps us to manage the speed of message throughput for a little smoother response. The result of changing any square in the matrix is to send eight get row messages back to back to the matrix control object. You'll notice that I'm using the right outlet of the Uzi object in this patch. That outlet sends out the number of the current index as it counts, so I can use that where I might otherwise add a counter object to my patch. Thanks to the display control subpatch, every time I click on a square in the 8x8 grid, eight lists of eight integers will be sent from the right outlet of the matrix control object, one after the other. Those lists of eight integers describe the state of individual squares in a row. Zero for off, one for on. Here's an example of one of those lists. The lists are then passed along to the matrix fill subpatcher to make the matrix used to produce visual output. Let's look inside and see how that's done. The jitter objects in our patch that calculate and display data are going to be using char data in the range 0 to 255. Since I'm working with black and white images, I really only need two colors with char data, 0 for black and 255 for white. But the list I receive from the matrix control object is composed of zeros and ones. So I use a vexpr object to multiply every item in every input list by 255. Next, a ZL group object collects all eight of the eight integer messages into a single 64 item list. And the JIT fill object rolls that list up into a single plane matrix whose dimensions are eight by eight. There are two more things I need to do in this subpatch. First, clicking on a square in the matrix control object sets its value to 1, so multiplying that value by 255 gives me a white square instead of a black one. The image will be backwards from what I'd expect. 
Correcting that's easily done by using a JIT op object with the bang minus operator, which subtracts each cell value in the matrix from 255 to reverse the image. Keep an eye out for this little trick. You'll be seeing it again. Finally, I'm going to want to work with and display a matrix that's a lot larger than 8x8 eight eight when I perform visual transformations. Creating that larger matrix is done by taking our single plane 8x8 eight eight matrix and sending it as input to a JIT matrix object whose planarity and dimensions we've set using arguments. When the smaller matrix is copied to the larger one, its contents are interpolated from the smaller to the larger matrix, and the single plane is copied to each of the four planes. So now, it's time to do some graphics processing. The matrix iterate subpatch looks a lot larger and has a lot more patch cords than its predecessors, but what happens inside isn't really all that complicated. The subpatch really uses two jitter objects to do almost all of the hard work. A jit rota object is used to produce and offset iterations of the original image, and a jit op object is used to calculate what the output image looks like when the images are overlapped and combined. When I decided to use the JIT Rota object to do my processing instead of writing to a named matrix multiple times as I'd originally intended, I realized that the JIT Rota object also gave me the ability to change the anchor points and offsets I could use when doing image processing by doing nothing more than sending anchor and offset messages with X and Y values. That was a nice addition to the patch. Similarly, by using the JIT op object, I could use different operations when combining these images, whereas my inspiration, Martin Thompson, only used a single process. Each of the iterations of this subpatch involves a pair of jitter objects. First, the JIT rota object takes an input image, scales it down by one half, which is set by using the zoom attributes, and then repeats the image at its boundaries so that the result is wrapped by default. That's set by using the bound mode 2 attribute. The result of that transformation is then combined with the previous version of the image and sent to the JIT op object, where the two images are combined to produce an output image. That image is then sent to two places, to a switch object down at the bottom here, and it's also passed along to another pair of JIT rota and JIT op objects. The switch object lets us choose which level of the recursive operation we want to display. Remember that trick we used with the JIT op object to invert the visual image in the matrix fill subpatcher? Well, here it is again. This time, it's used in conjunction with a switch object to let us choose an image or its inversion. Martin Thompson had to do his entire drawing a second time to do that, but all we need to do is click a toggle. We save the result of this processing to a JIT matrix object prior to outputting it so that we can save the contents as an image file using the export image message. So there you have it. I hope you enjoy experimenting with this patch and that it's a worthy homage to the work of the man who originally inspired me to create it. Happy Maxing!